Welcome to another production by the Millennial Mechanical Therapist. Your hosts, Dr. Joseph Gravino and Dr. Clay Case, are two physical therapists trying to treat health issues mechanically. Listen further for patient cases, guest videos, advantages and disadvantages of the way they practice, and much more. Thanks for tuning in today. Check us out on YouTube, Facebook, and at our website. We hope that you learn a lot from watching this video and you come back for more. Hello everybody, we are the Millennial Mechanical Therapists. Uh, my name is Joe. I'm Clay. And today we're going to talk about uh, mechanical diagnosis and therapy and athletes. So recently in August there was a uh, MDT uh, USA conference and one of the bigger topics was MDT and the athlete. Now unfortunately we weren't able to go uh, due to work, which Hopefully we'll find out more later, but we figured we'd give our little spin um, from our past experiences on how you deal with athletes in a more mechanically mechanical diagnosis and therapy-based mindset. And simply, I think both of us would go to say this, is I treat them no differently than I treat any other patient. Approach in the beginning, the in yep. the very beginning. <clears throat> the, yeah, the approach is just the same. You put them through repeated movements, sustained postures, and you try and see if you can put them inside one of the categories mm -hmm. and you'll find that a lot of your athletes will fall into a derangement category um, whether whatever body part it is neck back shoulder knee finger um, I've seen many things I think right now I have two knees uh, two patients with knee issues one's a football player and one's a runner um, both responding to similar yet slightly different uh, movements but both are within days going right back to their sport. So, I mean, this can be powerful for our athletes out there who, you know, get injured, whether that's in practice, in the game, and think that, you know, they're doomed when if you find something simple like one repeated movement, one sustained posture to get them through, they can quickly return back to their sport. And that's just nuts. Um, you know, getting someone back to their sport, especially an adolescent who, who just craves to be playing their sport, yeah. that can be huge. Um, now, obviously, they can fall into other categories, um, especially probably trauma. Trauma yeah. is a, a, an easy one that they can fall into because of how most of their injuries are done is through some sort Usually of trauma. traumatic, yeah. Right now, I'm working with a football player who is experiencing shoulder pain from a fall, and he fits into the trauma category, so he... The good thing is he's 16, so he's young. He's going to heal quick. Uh, but I think it kind of you hit just a little bit of a waiting game with that. I mean, trauma, the point is you have to let the tissues heal more than rearrange the situation going on with the derangement. There's not much to reduce in a trauma other than just control anything going on there, uh, any of the symptoms by using some modalities at times, ice in the beginning and things like that. And then... Uh, just general movement and uh, works for that because it's not like the kid is particularly weak overall he's weak now because of pain so he's got that nociceptive like inhibition to muscles but um, slowly work everything up there just make sure all of his tissues heal well and kind of go through the stages of, of healing of all of our tissues and work from there I mean that's kind of the framework that at least uh, I've been using with him and he fits into that, that category of trauma rather than uh, a derangement or dysfunction even. And we thoroughly screened that within uh, two visits and he just got absolutely nothing out of it. So, he's trauma. Which is awesome <clears throat> that you're at least able to figure out that he didn't fall into those typical three categories. Yeah. Which is good though, because you can look that person in the face and say this isn't gonna be quick, this is gonna be something else. Vice versa, mm -hmm. if you can tell that person this is going to be quick. I mean, that's awesome as well. I think the clarity in it is instead of just attacking this individual like, oh, they sprained their MCL or whatever and are going into this and you're just trying to fix them with strength, conditioning, loading, and, and potentially balance or, or proprioceptive work, which yeah. is definitely good things to tie in in more of that MDT mindset of like recovery function, 
which I would potentially say is good for these athletes regardless of what syndrome they go into, but yeah. afterwards. Um, but you're actually able to tell them, rule things in and out instead of using a special test. You're able to help them figure out and understand their situation at hand and then go forward from there in a very direct and a very specific episode of care, plan of care. Yeah, and it's nice just to, when somebody comes in with a trauma like that, it it doesn't mean necessarily that that traumatic accident rules them into the trauma category. Yeah, uh, We've both seen and everybody has seen people that have a trauma but are actually in the derangement category and they can rapidly resolve their symptoms and it's just uh, a slippery slope to go through a history and then hear, well, I fell directly on my shoulder, I hyper abducted it or anything like that, which is actually the case with my patient. And you use that and just assume that the trauma is the problem. In his case, it, that's true. But if you assume that, then uh, going with a trauma classification, you have to wait four or five weeks before somebody starts feeling really well because of tissue healing. Um, if that's your assumption from the get-go and you miss a derangement, well, you just kind of did a disservice to that patient of maybe two weeks. Yeah. So. And that's two weeks of crucial playing time. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, you can have individuals who are partial responders. Some individuals had maybe have some traumatic uh, situation going on, especially if you see them early enough, you may find them in the acute inflammatory phase, mm -hmm. but yet they start responding to repeated movements. Some patients will respond in a, in a pain way where their pain's getting better, um, but not all the way because of that acute uh, process, or maybe it's their mechanics are improving, their ability to use the extremity or the body part is improving, but yet pain is rather stable. So, I mean, these things can happen. You kind of, unfortunately, there's, you know, that's a blurry line that you have to play with um, on what is what. But I mean, even if you get that individual 50% able to move better, half the time that's what, they're, that's what they want anyways, and yeah. pain will follow suit. Yeah. So as uh, going forward here, you know, there are plenty of resources and tons of our videos even talk about how we approach derangement and dysfunction classifications, but the next couple videos we're going to throw out here, we're going to talk about how we approach those other categories like trauma and things like that. So be on the lookout for a couple of videos coming out about that. Yeah, it'll be interesting. Hope you guys stay tuned. Hope you learn from this stuff and, and you enjoy getting these little nuggets of information. Um, as we always say, move your patients early. Move them often. And move them to end range, my friends, because that's where the magic happens. Until next time.